All right, everyone. I think we're going to get started. I know we have folks still trickling in. I know there's a lot of uh, conflicts this morning and things like that. Um, but let's get started. Um, as I said, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, this is our academy session as part of platform security. And today's topic is about platform sensitive data discovery and anonymization. That's the theme of what we want to talk to you about. I'll talk about where that fits into the broader scheme of all the different things we offer as part of the platform security team. But most importantly, I want to talk about what's new in this release for detecting and protecting sensitive employee and customer data. Quick introductions. So uh, my name is Andrew Vitolo. I'm a principal outbound product manager on the platform security team. Um, I formerly had the opportunity to lead an inbound team, but recently has made the switch to outbound to help us get our products and platform security components into the hands of customers because security is uh, not a feature, it's an expectation. And we have fantastic foundational and uh, premium products that we offer. Now with me, you're probably familiar with the name uh, Farkat Salim. He's unable to make it. I can't talk about too much details because of privacy why he's not here but just uh, we're wishing him and his family all the best. Uh, he has some exciting uh, developments happening, can't say more, uh, but I know he was really excited to be here and he spent a lot of time getting ready for this presentation. You might know for Fercott, he worked on Virtual Agent, Live Agent, NLU, Employee Center, AI Search, um, and then recently in the last couple of years, he's been hosting these Academy sessions. So he'll be back soon, um, but um, he's not gonna be with us today. But I got someone uh, wonderful to join us instead, um, and I'm going to introduce Barka Bathija, that I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, she is my partner in crime on the inbound side for data privacy. So she's the person that's working with engineering, prioritizing the roadmap, and she's uh, graciously joined to just listen in. She's actually going to give a demo of some of the things I'm going to talk about, and then she'll be around for Q&A. Barka, do you want to just say hello to our participants? Hello, everyone. Thank you, Andrew, for such a warm welcome. Um, yes, I'm super excited for what's happening with Furkat and looking forward to hearing more from him. But I'm very excited to be here today and also excited to demo uh, what's new in Washington in data privacy. Awesome, Barka. Awesome. Thank you. Um, just normal safe harbor notice by looking at this screen and attending this particular webinar academy session, uh, your uh, acknowledge that you are know that we're going to have forward-looking statements that may influence our quarterly reports and findings. Mostly, most of the things we're going to talk about today are what's new in Washington. So these are things that are GA, but occasionally, especially with Barca here, she might be excited and tell talk about some of the exciting things we're working on. So just be aware, this is uh, confidential, sensitive, uh, information and uh, should not be disclosed without uh, checking with your governance team. Um, with that out of the way, um, let's talk about the agenda. So we're going to do a quick overview of what ServiceNow Data Privacy is. We're going to talk about some of the new features as part of the Washington release. Uh, we're going to go through a demo, talk about some of the ways you can stay engaged. We actually have a blog post that went live today. And then we'll turn it over to Q&A and uh, Bark and I will try to answer some of your questions. With that said, let's talk about ServiceNow data privacy. And uh, the, the kind of the theme is we have purpose-built capabilities that are both foundational to the platform and part of our premium bundles that are there to safeguard sensitive data on ServiceNow instances. Um, and what that means is our target uh, in terms of who our customers are, our ServiceNow customers and partners that host both employee and their customers' data. So if the company interfaces at all with like a B2B2C model, that is in scope, right? So uh, some of the sensitive data could be from employees, like for example, start of employment and social security number, or it could be consumers where they enter their credit card information. Our team, part of platform security, specifically focuses on that persona, building the products and the tools for customers to pro properly handle sensitive data. Now, again, I always like to tee things up of, well, why does this matter? 
I think uh, if you've just recently read some of the headlines and just continued uh, data leaks, uh, privacy is very much in the eyes of consumers. And the reason that matters is because as consumers continue to uh, demand privacy, consumers are effectively employees. I'm a consumer for a bunch of uh, con con consumer products, for example, Amazon, but at the same time, I'm a ServiceNow employee. And if the sentiment is that I am concerned about how my sensitive data is being handled, that applies to my employee work, 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 workflow profile, um, as well as the consumer profile for you know, my online shopping and things like that. And the sentiment is pretty clear. 87% of consumers say they will not do business with a company if they have concerns about business security practices. I think we all know that. That's the essence of why we have Vault. Uh, but more importantly, consumers would not buy from an organization if they didn't trust businesses with their data. And then lastly, business proponents said that customers would not buy from them if their data was not properly protected. And by the way, this is from a study that PwC did in 2017. So I sense that if this study was done again today, those numbers would be a lot higher. Um, and that's just because, again, with more data flowing, more IoT devices, um, um, even the monetization of data, uh, uh, it's very much in top of mind for consumers and employees alike. Um, so that's the problem statement. And I know our customers from the conversations we have, they are very interested in taking steps on this. Um, there is a desire from a company perspective to address customer needs, right? Like the product management 101. But the thing is, even if there is an interest from our customers to actually invest in properly safeguarding sensitive data, there is still all kinds of different compliance um, standards and regulations that businesses have to pay attention to. So the key takeaway here is that the data privacy is really a top priority in business strategy from the chief legal officer to the CISO to the CEO, CMO, um, and then risk and compliance. And just to give some examples of, um, you know, the kind of challenges that um, our customers face when it comes to data privacy uh, is data governance for personal information of employees that are no longer part of the organization. What's that retention um, span, depending on what compliance and governance is in place? And then how do you properly handle that information and anonymize it? Um, another example is GDPR compliance. We also call it the right to be forgotten. Uh, we need to know where the PII data resides and create an inventory of it so that you can properly classify it and properly handle it and dispose of it as needed. HIPAA, of course, in medical, one of the common use cases that Bark and I have seen with all of our data privacy tools is um, we can't have sensitive data in test and dev environments and it poses a risk of exposure. So the data is anonymized before it gets put into those particular test and dev environments. And then last but not least, uh, privacy policies, right? Um, I think a lot of customers, especially with Gen AI, hint, hint, I'll talk about, um, I'm, I'm giving you a preview of uh, what we're gonna be talking about at Knowledge. But as there's a more desire to take make sense of data, we've acquired all of this data and to share it and make sense of it, um, that's fine. There's all kinds of different reasons for that, but there are privacy policies of what can and cannot be done with data. So before it could be used by contractors, third parties, or even internal, you have to review that. And then more importantly, properly um, uh, normalize the data or handle the data before being able to work with it. So that's kind of me talking about the importance of data privacy and what it means to our particular customers and partners. Next, I'm going to talk about um, just a brief overview that data privacy is just one of the controls of a holistic um, need that our customers have for securing their data and their assets on the ServiceNow platform. So we're going to be talking about data privacy today, which is available as part of our Vault bundle, but it's also available as a standalone SKU. So if, for example, a customer is maybe not quite ready for Vault, um, but wants to take advantage of some of the data privacy capabilities, they can do so. And that just really has to do with the size of the organization. So it's it's more of where they're at. We, we're trying to meet them over that. That's why we have a standalone SKU. Uh, but really a comprehensive solution, just really quick. 
Um, we need to think about it. Does it make sense to uh, properly anonymize data or is it the right, the data should be encrypted? Um, code signing and just maybe making sure that uh, mid servers have not been tampered with. We have log export service for sending logs for re review. Uh, secrets management, uh, again, uh, sensitive keys and uh, maintaining uh, API keys and secrets on the platform. And then newest is zero trust access, which is all about advanced authentication controls based on who you are and narrowing the frame of uh, access depending on data patterns. So really exciting. Um, I'll talk a little bit about other upcoming Academy sessions to go deeper on those. But back on topic, let's just do a quick, quick recap about what ServiceNow data privacy is. It's made up of three components. One of them, again, is foundational to the platform, meaning customers can start using it today, and that is classifying your data. So before you can decide how you want to act on your data, it's really foundational and really important to classify your data and understand what kind of data is this? Is this sensitive data? Is this data that could be uh, very risky and damaging to our organization if it leaks to an unintended party, uh, external party? What about internal? Um, it might not even be that the data is sensitive to leave uh, you know, the organization, but internally, should, for example, someone in HR have access to, um, you know, someone's, um, I don't know, a code base or whatnot. I don't, not a perfect example, but it could be, it's just about a data segregation and segregation of duties. That's where classification comes in. But you can't really, let's say you do have all of these different compliance drivers and you're trying to help customers. You can't really get start, started on doing that until you start going through and figuring out what is sensitive and what's not. And customers can, again, start doing that today. But what we've been hearing and what we're trying to do is help customers uh, save time and go back to, and focus on their core business. So that's why we have things like the data discovery component and the data anonymization component as uh, add-ons that we think that are going to really save them a lot of time and, and resources. So let's say you're classifying your data, but maybe you're having a hard time, you have so much data, you're having a hard time of really knowing where sensitive data could be, it could exist. That's where data discovery comes in that allows you to formulate effectively uh, data patterns and looking for particular kinds of patterns of data, such as social security numbers, credit card numbers, phone numbers, et cetera, that will help you discover that sensitive data and then be able to properly classify it. So those really go hand in hand. Now, okay, you classify the data, you've discovered it. Well, sometimes the whole point and why we want to mitigate the risk of data being leaked, or even if we know it's sensitive data, storing it in plain text is not an option, right? Uh, we want to make sure that if it, if some, if an unauthorized, unintended party did access the data, uh, that the company would be. Um, would be safe from uh, the data being potentially extracted, right? That's where data anonymization comes in place. And that's you, I'll show you in some examples, that's like overwriting a social security number or a phone number uh, with values that cannot be actually consumed by someone looking at the data, both at the application layer and at the database layer. So if someone got into your database, they're not gonna do anything with that social security number because it's been properly anonymized. So that's the overview of data privacy. And I think let's get to the meat and the potatoes of this presentation and let's talk about what's new in Washington. Okay, I'm gonna pause. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is uh, data discovery and an enhancement we've made for uh, data pattern matching for partial anonymization. And what does that mean? Um, in this example here, you can see a screenshot. There are is a that you see the test uh, test data input, and you see that there's a social security number. And then you would like to change change it. And then more importantly, here's my phone number. With partial anonymization that we've added for data discovery, it allows you to anonymize the sensitive information here, which is the social security number and the phone number without losing context of what the uh, conversation or description is about. So think about a uh, incident and a description field. It's important for context for agents to be able to understand that customers would like to have a change or be able to review that, but 
they also don't want that sensitive information being stored on the back end on the database. And this is where the uh, partial data anonymization comes into place, that uh, if someone was to consume and look at that ticket, they would not see that sensitive information. It's possible that one of the agents was it would have been able to see this information, but the moment it becomes anonymized, no one else can see that information. So you're really narrowing the uh, blast radius of that sensitive data being exposed. Very, very important for our customers. It's been something that's been on a wish list for a while. Um, and again, uh, this has come out uh, as part of the Washington release. The next one I'm going to talk about is a data discovery and keyword support and data patterns. This one's really, really interesting and cool. So um, if you know if those of you that haven't attended this sessions before, uh, we had the ability to be able to use regular expressions to be able to detect uh, sensitive data and properly handle it. Now, what do you do in the scenario? And I'm just going to kind of see if I can hover my mouse around this, um, where you have um, something like a date and the date is in a specific format and there's multiple dates on that particular format, right? And that could be something like a date of birth. It can be an employee start date. How do you target the specific piece of information that you want to potentially anonymize or discover and anonymize? That's where this capability with keyword pairing and proximity detection come into place. What it does is it allows you to define a key, which the key is you're going to be looking for, let's say you're looking for, instead of the employee start date, you're looking for the date of birth. The key is date of birth. So what you would add is, you know, if if in a particular database it was DOB, you would add the keyword DOB. If the database was date of birth, you would add date of birth. That way, when we go through and discover the sensitive data, we are able to actually target that particular piece of key value pair and then properly handle that particular piece of data. So very powerful, allows you to be much more precise and targeted with your discovery of sensitive data on a ServiceNow instance. Um, so that's that's a, that, one, that one I'm really excited about. And I think we have several customers that are uh, already getting their hands on this today. And then the third one, I think this one's the most exciting. And um, again, I'm gonna have Barka kind of go talk us through the demo, um, but we have a lot of exciting thoughts on where we're going with this. But uh, for the first time ever, uh, we are introducing data privacy APIs on our platform. And we're calling them re real-time APIs because as soon as you call the API, we perform the, uh, the action. And these APIs apply to both data discovery and data anonymization. Why is this important? Well, in the example here, um, we have a short description and we have a description. And again, we have some sensitive data there. At the time, an agent goes through and maybe they enter that information, maybe the customer entered it in there. The moment the update or commit has occurred, those APIs can be called through, for example, like a business rule, and then the data can immediately be potentially anonymized right at that, that, that time of the entry of the data. So if you can imagine an incident, that's really, really powerful again. And it's similar to the use case we talked about below is handling the data as it enters the, the instance and the perimeter, right? So effectively, we're creating an API that's acting like a data privacy firewall that gives you the opportunity to handle the data as soon as it enters the instance and then is properly anonymized. Um, so, uh, and that also uh, helps with the keyword support and things like that. So um, those are the really three key features of the Washington release. And I know that me talking about it is just part of it. Um, I think at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Barka and she's gonna talk through a scenario um, and do a quick demo of how we could put all of these different things into motion. So Barka, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Oh, I think you got it and over to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Andrew. That was great information. A lot of information, but very nice information. So have you ever run across, um, have, have you come across a scenario where you have a lot of incidents which are reported either from your employees or your customers and maybe accidentally or maybe because to get the incident resolved, they had to add some PII 
some sensitive information in the incident. Now, all of us know it's not safe to have sensitive information everywhere floating around in the incidents because a lot of people have access to incidents. So there is a legal liability, there is a legal risk of having sensitive data exposure. In that scenario, what do you do? How do you mitigate that scenario? So for that, I have, on this instance, I have HR service delivery installed. And I also have data discovery installed. Data discovery is a store app. So I have that installed along with data privacy store app. So first let's go to data discovery. So under data discovery, I'm gonna first, this is this is always going to be the first step. I'm gonna look at all the active, uh, all the data patterns. So right now here, I have few data patterns which are either shipped out of the box or few of them are custom as well. What's new in Washington is with every data pattern, there is an associated privacy technique. So for here, we have credit card American Express. So this is out of box data pattern. And by default, we have a privacy technique of selective replace with X, which is associated with it. The data privacy admin does have the permissions to go ahead and change the privacy technique, which is associated with a data pattern. What, what this association essentially does is wherever credit card American Express will be discovered, only that particular um, pattern will be anonymized with the selective replace. So that helps by keeping the complete business context alive. So you still have the business context, but we are only anonymizing the sensitive data. Now let's look at a data pattern that I have created custom, which is date of birth. If I go to date of birth, now there isn't really any difference between the format of date of birth or date of hire. And what we are doing here is I am doing date of birth with keywords. So I have the regular expression of MMDDYY. Along with that, I'm searching for some keywords like DOB, date of birth. So wherever I find this expression, along with these keywords, which are in the keyword proximity of around 20 characters, around this expression, that's where I will confidently say that, yes, this is my date of birth and this is how I will discover it. So the keyword support and the keyword proximity is new in Washington. And this is something which gives more confidence in the data pattern because regex can be complicated. Regex can result into some false positives as well. So with keyword, we are just making it more precise. So once I have all the data patterns here, this is essentially the first step. And this is not a step that the admin will do over and over again. It's just something that you set up everything um, in the beginning. And after that, it's mainly about just configuration. So the next one is I'm going to go to active data pattern. Active data pattern is the list of data patterns that I want either to be scanned as part of next job or as part of real time. Now, what's new in Washington is with every data pattern, there is a priority or a order list. So in case if there is a conflict between two regular expression, which regular expression will take the priority and which will be anonymized the first. So that is what the order is about. If I go to edit, here I would typically see the available list and I can move it to the selected list. With the help of up and down arrow, I can pick the order of the data patterns. Now I'm gonna go to the second store app, which is the data privacy. So under data privacy, we have classification and we have anonymization. Once I go to anonymization, under anonymization, there are multiple techniques which are shipped out of box. So everything that you see here as base, like data pattern anonymization, selective replace with X, selective replace, all of these are base. Along with these base techniques, I have created some custom techniques. For example, replace date of birth. If I go to replace date of birth, click on edit. So this is using the base technique of selective replace. So for date of birth, I want to keep the format of the date of birth. So in this case, since I want to keep the format, I am excluding the hyphen and I'm replacing the sensitive characters with asterisk. You also have an option of either anonymizing fully or partially. So in case of credit card number, you want to keep the last four digits 
and maybe the first digit as well to understand if it comes from Visa, MasterCard or Amex. So we can have the start index as second and end index as 12. But for now, I just want to keep the format. I do not want to keep any sensitive data. That's the reason I am starting it from one. Similarly, for selective replace SSN, I have done the same. I'm using the selective replace technique. If I go to next, I'm going to start with one. I'm going to exclude the dash and I'm going to replace it with an asterisk. Now, uh, what we have done in Washington is we have come up with data privacy APIs, which are basically two different APIs. One is data discovery API and the other one is the anonymization API. Now, these APIs can be called either from business rules or from the flow designer as well. Now, the beauty of these APIs is it gives you a lot of flexibility so that you can discover data either on insert, you can discover an anonymized data, <coughs> excuse me, after a particular condition is met. So in this scenario, I have a business rule created in which I am sanitizing description and short description, which is associated with the HR case. So here I'm going to monitor the HR case table. This is active and advanced, and I'm going to trigger this business rule as soon as the state of the HR case is changed to closed complete. Now think about a scenario in which uh, in an incident you have sensitive data, but you still want to keep that sensitive data in order to resolve the incident. So this is when you would say the state. So you want to keep the sensitive data, but as soon as the incident is changed to close complete, you want to anonymize it. So that's when you would call the business rule. So this is where I've specified when to run. If I go in advanced, I literally have um, a three line script for description and short description in which I'm just calling the APIs to discover and anonymize the sensitive data, everything that was there in the active data pattern list. With that, let's go and see how it works for incidents. So here I have HR cases. Now let's look at a HR case which ends in 100. If I open this right now, it's in the state ready. Um, state is ready and under short description, I don't have any PII. It just says update SSN and date of birth. But under description, I do see a lot of PII, which is unable to update SSN to XYZ, then the date of birth in the HR portal. So this user probably is a new user and they are not able to update their PII, their personal information in the HR portal. In this scenario, in order to resolve the incident, we need to have this SSN number and date of birth so that we can we can update it in the HR profile. So that's the reason we are going to keep it till the incident is closed. So here under description, I have SSN number, I have date of birth, I have email ID, and I also have the phone number. So let's say the agent goes ahead and updates the HR profile with all the info. I go and change the state to closed complete. And once I've done that, I'm going to click on update. Go back to the HR case, which is 100. And under description, it is all anonymized. So um, the SSN number has been anonymized, but the format of the SSN is still intact based on the technique that we used. Similarly, date of birth, email ID, and also the phone number are all anonymized. Once a sensitive data is anonymized, it is actually changed in the database. There is no way to get it back. And this is what makes it so unique and special because according to privacy, um, you do not want to have any legal liability of keeping the sensitive data if you no longer need it. In this scenario, we needed the sensitive data just to update the HR, HR portal. Once the HR portal is updated, we don't really need to keep the sensitive data. We still need to keep the incident and the business 
for recording for audit and record purpose, but we don't need to keep the sensitive data. That's the reason we've anonymized the sensitive data, but we have also kept the business context in terms of when was the incident open? When was it closed? What did the user want? We have all the business context here without actually oversharing or without actually having any sensitive data leakage. Thank you. With that, um, Andrew, I'll pass it over to you. Sounds good. Thank you, Barka. Um, I think at this point, let me go ahead and I'm just going to, uh, hiding from me, I'm going to go and turn it back over to questions after that demo. I know we had one, um, and feel free to use the Q&A feature of Zoom, uh, but we had someone ask, uh, Barka. Oh, Bar Barka, are you, I see you're typing an answer already. Do you want to just I answer? Can, yeah, I can just um, do the answer live. So the question is, does the data discovery run on all tables or can you select where you may not want it to obfuscate the data like HR case management? Right. So um, something which I missed showing in the demo is target tables. So under target tables, you can pick the tables that you want the discovery to run on. So once you pick the tables, for example, you can pick either just the incident table, just the task table or the HR table and the discovery and anonymization will run only on those tables, keeping the sensitive data in other tables intact without even touching them. Thank you. Thank you, Barka. That's wonderful. Um, I think the next question we have is um, just helping customers get started. Um, let's say that today they, you know, they they might be familiar with some level of classification, uh, but they're maybe not feeling like they're they're doing enough. What's the best way to go from just starting with getting familiar with classification, and then when do you introduce data discovery to to your you know suite of of quote unquote tools in your portfolio? Yeah, so that, that's a very interesting question. So data classification is installed by default. The plugin is installed by default, <clears throat> excuse me, as part of the platform capability. So anyone can start using classification as early as right away, right? So um, classification really helps uh, to create an inventory of data. So, uh, and there isn't really a NIST standard for data classification, and it really depends on the data governance of every organization. How, how do they really want to classify the data? I have seen customers classify it as um, just one single layout, which says sensitive, restricted, public. Mm -hmm. there, there are other customers who classify it based on workflows. Like this is the HR workflow, and under HR workflow, they can have subclasses as well. So it's really up to the customers what, what works best based on their legal practices, based on the data governance practices. So data classification can help you, just classification by itself can help you if you know where you have sensitive data. So for example, under HR, uh, under HR profile, I know I have a column for name and I just want to classify it. I can just go ahead and classify that simply. But um, what if you have sensitive data in places where you don't know about it? It can either be dark data where it should not be, or it can be where it should be, but it's I, I just did not know about that. That's when data discovery comes into the picture, which can help you discover and uncover these different areas. And once you've done that, you have an option of either deleting, anonymizing that data if you don't need it, or you also have an option of classifying the data so that you have a clean inventory and a good way to start the protection mechanism or to you know, just come up with the whole protection strategy for your organization. Wow, uh, that was very well succinctly said, Barka. Thank you. Um, we had one other question. I think this is a follow-on on data discovery and running on tables. Uh, there's a question about handling the audit history. Um, I don't have any more context than that. Is that enough for you to be able to answer? Yes, yes. So as of today, we do not um, anonymize. We cannot discover and anonymize sensitive data in the audit history, mainly because we want to keep the audit history immutable for compliance purposes. But 
Um, I'm not surprised with this question. This has come up a few more times. Um, so uh, it would be great to understand a bit more about the use cases, why you would like to anonymize sensitive data in the audit history, and how are we going to uh, handle compliance thereof? So this is an item I'm working on as part of roadmap. I cannot have, I do not have any commitment for this. Um, I, I think at this stage, I am just trying to understand more use cases and what will be the different areas where uh, anonymizing audit history will be valuable. Yeah, that sounds great. And I think whoever posted that was anonymous attendees. So hopefully you have a way to reach us um, and uh, we're happy to sit down and have a chat with you uh, if that's a requirement for your customer. So um, I don't see any other questions on our backlog. Um, Barka, did you want to have any other final parting thoughts or anything that you would like to leave? Otherwise, I'm going to cover more resources and wrap this up. Yeah, so why don't we cover resources? And the other thing I would like to add is, so you can try it today, data discovery and data anonymization, both in your sub prod. So for prod, yes, you definitely need entitlement, but for testing it in sub prod, you do not need entitlement. You can test it today. So test it out, see what use cases it works for you. What, what are the different use cases that will work for you? And we'll be happy to, you know, get any feedback from you, any any concerns, questions, any feedback, any roadmap items from you. We'll be more than happy to discuss it further. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Barka. Um, and then as I mentioned, uh, there's several QR codes here. You can go through our list of various uh, platform privacy and security uh, recordings on YouTube. It's actually specifically for our data privacy track that goes deeper into classification, discovery, and anonymization. There's also our product documentation uh, where you could just look and get a little more details of activating the plugins and all the different bells and whistles in the product. And then last but not least, we have our community uh, blog and site. And actually today we launched a blog post talking about real-time, our real-time API and real-time uh, discovery and anonymization. So definitely check that out. Um, that's going to be, that's kind of going hand in hand with this Academy session. And the only other thing that I wanted to mention is we will have additional Academy sessions. This is our first one of the year. So welcome back. Um, and then we will have the next one on Zero Trust Access session validation. We're going to talk about Access Analyzer, which has been growing tremendously, and um, specifically user comparison, platform encryption. And then August, uh, in the summertime, we're going to get into access controls, which I know is a big top of mind item for our customers. Last thing, um, not sure if anyone on the webinar is going to be at Knowledge, but definitely check out some of our talks at Knowledge, uh, specifically safeguarding sensitive data where it lives with ServiceNow Vault, uh, mainly through the encryption angle. Um, but, you know, that, that applies sensitive data handling also applies to data privacy. And then we're going to be talking about, Mark and I are going to be talking about navigating AI privacy with confidence. That's a big topic at Knowledge. And last but not least, we're going to talk about overall, how do we address the various challenges customers have with security with ServiceNow Vault. And that's actually going to be with our VP GM, our outbound leader, and our field security team uh, leader and Will. With that, I'd like to thank everyone so much for their time. Uh, we look forward to interfacing with you at the next Academy session. Uh, hopefully you learned something new about data privacy today. And don't hesitate to reach out to Bark and I uh, we are here to answer your questions, and we really want to do right by our customers. With that, thank you so much. Have a great, wonderful rest of your day. Good night. We'll talk to you all soon. Thank you.